Welcome, and we're with a very dis distinguished and special guest today, um, Rauni Kilda, who's coming to us from Finland. Uh, Ra Rauni is uh, the former chief medical officer of Lapland in uh, Finland, and for those of you who are not familiar with her, I'd like to read from uh, Rauni's bio, because it, it is a, a wide-ranging and distinguished one in a number of areas that we all are interested in. In 1982, uh, Rauni published uh, a book in, in English, it would be called There Is No Death. She had been interested in the paranormal she, as, since she was a teenager, but her interest in UFOs uh, may date to a 1985 car accident which led, which led to her retirement. She has been featured she has been a featured speaker at UFO conferences, helped organize the first international conference on extraterrestrials in Finland, and has authored books about UFOs, alien abductions, mind control, and about the the New World Order. Uh, uh, um, Brownie has had interactions with extraterrestrials who have been uh, taking her out of dangerous situations and has relationships w with them. And, and she has told of a secret exchange program between humans and extraterrestrials that has been deliberately suppressed by powerful Western governments, particularly the United States. Uh, and this is the area where I where uh, I have met uh, where where I first uh, uh, <clears throat> met Rauni, and that is um, uh, the the area that Rauni is working in uh, is an area where there are secret military and intelligence agencies practicing mind control technology on the world population using cell phones, supercomputers. Uh, and uh, her article on uh, cybernetic implants as a means of mind control, it's called Microchip Implants, Mind Control, and Cybernetics, is widely circulated. Uh, and Rauni was one of the early people to alert the world to the dangers of the Bilde Bilderberger Group, uh, uh, the WHO and the depopulation plans of Agenda 21. So welcome, Brownie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of start off with each of those topics and start off with your first book, There Is No Death, uh, because that's a, uh, a topic which is now coming into great interest as people become uh, aware of parapsychology and the scientific study uh, of the afterlife. And of course, this was in 1982, which is uh, almost, 30, almost 30 years ago. And could you explain how in 1982, after uh, just being Finland's chief, chief, chief medical officer, you came to these conclusions and you wrote this book and you had the afterlife as your uh, focus. Well, when I was 15 years old, I had a relative called Sulve who told me that in three previous lives she had been married to her husband who was a professor of medicine. And I had never ever heard a word of previous lives. I was a teenager. But I admired her and I thought, well, if this intelligent woman tells me things like this, I want to find out. And I started in the 50s digging into any literature and there was not very much in the 50s in Finland. But anyway, I, I got whatever I did and then 20 years passed and she had been following me and my career uh, until I became even um, acting Surgeon General of Finland. But I see. Uh, but um, it was very interesting that she wrote a letter to me and said that I have been following your life 
and I'm very glad that you ha you are on the right path. And the reason why I wrote the the book Kuolemai uh, Ole in Finnish, there is no death, is is very strange because. I wrote it in 24 hours, and that is normally not possible. And it happened so that I had become, at that time, a chief medical officer of Lapland in Rovaniemi at the Polar Circle in Finland. And Lapland is 100,000 square kilometers, bigger than Benelux countries altogether. And uh, I was invited to come to a, to a meeting, and I said, what meeting? It was a teacher who called me and said, well, I know that you're curious about the paranormal, and we have a meditation group here in Rovaniemi, would you like to join? And I had never ever meditated and I'm very curious, so I said, sure, I'll come. And it was an interesting group. There was an army army captain, there was a hairdresser, there was a, a nurse's aide and a nurse and, and me being a, a medical doctor and then, uh, then this, uh, this, um, this lady who invited me. And uh, there we sat every Tuesday for one hour, put a candle on the on the table, closed our eyes, and tried not to think of anything. Just blanco. Well, of course, all my thoughts just, you know, went up and down, up and down. Until one day after several weeks, all of a sudden, my hand got up by itself in the meditation. And I couldn't hinder it. It just went up and started doing the figure eight. And of course, now I know figure eight is the sign of eternity sideways and then I realized that this could be starting of automatic writing and so I said in my thoughts that right into the air and of course this figure eight stopped immediately my hand stopped in the air and it started writing S O L V E I G Sulve and then it dropped and that was the name of my relative, who, when I was 15, said that, you know, I have been married in my previous lives to my husband. And that was flabbergasting. Next time, I took a pen and a pencil with me because I thought, if this happens again, I want to write down. And sure enough, my hand started acting funny again. And I, I put the pencil into it and I said, write into the paper. And then she wrote the whole name her first name, Sulve, her last name, and said, I am alive. She had died two months previously at the age of 51. She had a thyroid cancer. And when I had told her you should operate it, she said, no, this is karmic. I have to live with it. Okay. So she said, I am alive. And then she said, God is love. And that was it. And I was quite shocked in a way because when I tried to pull my hand down, it, it couldn't. I couldn't. With the other hand, I just could not. There was a force that was so big that I couldn't. And I was afraid that I would get a stroke or something. Well, then came a third time. And then the same thing happened. And my writing said, you're going to Malaysia. And I didn't even know where Malaysia was. Why would I go from Lapland to Malaysia? And then only two weeks passed. And guess what? I got a telephone call from the National Board of Health in Helsinki. And they said, we need, the International Red Cross has just uh, telexed, we need immediately a medical advisor to Malaysia who has a degree in, in tropical medicine, which I did. And I thought, this is weird. And I said, look, I have to go and, and you know check these things, but I already heard about it two weeks ago. And they said, no, no, the telex came today. I said, I have it in writing that I'm going to Malaysia. And then I wondered what is going to happen to me in Malaysia. So I meditated again with the group and I said, what am I going to do? Because I had just started that. I didn't know if, you know, what I was actually dealing with, what kind of energies. I was just a beginner. So my hand wrote again, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And I said, fine. And flew to Kuala Lumpur, was there for two weeks and went to the Swiss embassy because the ambassadors gave her a uh, luncheon to Red Cross ladies. And there I met a little Chinese lady a young woman who said, oh, my name is Gina. I said, my name is Rowney. I come from Finland. I'm a medical advisor. And the first thing she said, would you like to join our group? And I said, what group? Well, we are a group of seven Chinese women. We are developing our psychical abilities. And I just thought, blew my, you know, 
good Lord. Somebody did say, we'll take care of it. And I joined the group once a week. And they had never seen anybody doing automatic writing. And I had never seen anybody doing automatic dancing that, like they were doing. And then my writing changed rapidly and said, give your hand. Your book is already written on this side. We need your hand. And it's going to be called, you know, there's, a, there's still no death and whatever. And <laughs> it was quite, you know, flabbergasting to me. And the thing is that I did write it in the automatic writing um, part of it in 24 hours. Not straight, but, you know, two hours, half an hour, one hour. And I even wrote in, in, when I came back to Finland in pitch darkness. All of a sudden in the morning, it's about, about 1, 1 a.m., I woke up and I heard a voice that said, get up and write. And I thought, oh, looks full moon, November, cold. And I, oh, I'm tired. You have taken a job to do, get up and write. So I got up and I thought, I have to go and put on the light. The voice says to me, you don't need light. You don't write yourself. And I, I was like, okay, take a pen and a pencil. I always have it now next to my bed. And I got up and I started writing extremely fast. And I thought, this is nothing. It can't be anything because it goes like this. Exactly one hour. And then it dropped. And I fell asleep. And in the morning, I thought, hey, what happened at night? So I took the pen and the pencil next to it. And there was 30 pages of beautiful antique script written by my dead grandmother's uh, handwriting which I recognized because when, when I was confirmed at the age of 15, she wrote something nice on, into my Bible. And that was the same handwriting. And of course, I was shocked. After all, I mean, you know, I was a reasonable medical doctor and I didn't <laughs> understand these things at all. I didn't know that man is a mind, not a body. But of course, then I started getting into the thing. And of course, since at the time also I was... Uh, the chief medical officer and in other very high positions in Finland. So, of course, it became best seller number one in Finland, best seller number five in Sweden, best seller number one in Norway. And it, it's uh, translated to six languages, including Spanish, and sold immediately 170,000 books, which is an awful lot for a prime you know, author who has never written anything. So, uh, after that, I respect the dimensions. I have gotten into it. And parapsychology, in my mind, automatic writing is part of it, is one step, maybe the first step, at least for me. Then came UFO question, our cosmic contacts. Then came mind control. And I know something is coming, but I don't know yet, because we are going one step by one step by one step. And uh, today... Uh, I take it for granted that I have contacts with different dimensions, also with other so-called dead. Nobody is dead, but their bodies are dead, but their, their energy is, is, of course, alive. And also, I have co had contacts with ETs. But the main thing, I think, the most important secret in the whole world is to be a human being on this planet. Because even doctors forget, even if we know, but we forget, we focus always on the body. It's male, female, it's dolphin, it's dog, cat, whatever. We focus on the body instead of the energy. And when we know, medical profession knows that 70% of your body is water and 87% of our brain is water. So what holds us together? Of course, it is energy. And energy only changes form, even according to Einstein, it can never disappear. So we are energy beings. And of course, energy never, never dies. And we can never, never die. And then when I started experimenting with, um, with myself, when I read about out-of-body experiences and, and, and things like that, that just opened the whole universe to me. And when I was once operated as a young doctor, I had a near-death experience in the operation. All of a sudden, my energy body, which is always a copy of your physical body without handicaps and very interestingly, without inner organs and without sexual organs. That is very interesting. We don't have sexual organs in our core, in our energy body, and that explains a lot of phenomena. 
Well, anyway, I started floating in the, in the, into the air, into the ceiling, and I was being physically operated by my colleagues. So I was watching my, my operation, my stomach, you know, being open. And it's quite a, you know, experience, I would say. And then I realized that the, I could read the thoughts of the surgeon. I don't know how, but I could. And I tried to warn him from my energy body up there in the ceiling. Don't, don't, don't cut there because I, I have a little abnormal anatomy and there is a, 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 a artery there. And if you cut there, you know, things can go wrong. Of course, he couldn't hear me. And he just took the scalpel and cut it right there. And my blood zoomed to the ceiling. And then I had a near experience, which I now know about, but I, I had never even heard about it before. So you go to a tunnel, you meet a light. And that light was so beautiful and so strong that I went on my knees. And it for me, because I'm raised up in a Lutheran state religion in Finland and in Scandinavia, so it looked like a, a huge statue of Christ with, with a tunic on and even sandals. And I was just on my knees. I couldn't look up all the way to the face because it was too bright, but I saw up to the knees. And that light told me things that are going to happen to me in my life. And I was just listening. I, 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 you know, what else could I have done? And explained how, how even bad things that are going to happen all have a meaning. There's always a meaning of, of um, spiritual growth, whatever happens to you. And also then I was asked to turn around. I turned around and I saw a sea and I saw white pearls. The whole sea was filled with white pearls. And there was one black pearl. And I realized that that was my husband. He wasn't black that it was bad or anything of that, but, but that I could have, you know, differentiated him from all the thousands of, of, of other souls representing as, as, uh, as uh, white pearls. And he was very much behind me. And somehow I understood that uh, we were going to be separated. And there was nothing wrong at that time in our marriage. And when I woke up from a, from the, the anesthesia, I told my husband that, look, what I have, I have experienced something incredible. And he said just, well, you have lost two liters of blood. So it was, you know, lack of oxygen in your brain. Well, 45% of Americans who have experienced the same thing I know now from Gallups say it was the most significant thing that has ever happened in their life. And I fully agree. I fully agree. Well, of course, after that, I started experimenting with my, myself and getting out of body. And I succeeded with first try, which was, you know, quite a thing, I thought. I, I went to uh, half sleep. I was even naked, sleeping in my bed in Rovaniemi, Lapland. And I had my knees up. And it was interesting that when I started concentrating all my energy from my feet and from my hands to my, towards my head, I started vibrating in five, six layers as if radio frequencies would have gone through my body. I don't know if it took one minute or if it took a uh, hundred seconds. All of a sudden, I was in my body and I was floating exactly in the same position with my knees up towards the ceiling and watching my own body. And I have been, uh, for instance, senior anesthetist uh, in a hospital already when I was a student, so I can count 60 seconds without a clock any time. So I saw that, that that body of mine was breathing very, very slowly, and I got worried. So I started counting the, the breath rate, and it was 10 a minute instead of 20 a minute, which is normal. And then I got worried, and then I descended and took with my astral energy body's hand my pulse or my physical. I started counting one, two, three, or it was 32 instead of 60, which would be normal when you're resting. And of course, then I really got worried. And I said, mother, help me, because I thought, now I'm going to die. I can't get, you know, go back to my body. And immediately, in a second, I was in southern Finland, in Helsinki, from Lapland, and saw my mother in the living room, sewing a long dress by hand. And my niece was five uh, years old and was chatting. I couldn't hear what they were there saying but she was just drawing pictures and I know it wasn't important and then I thought where is my sister because mother is babysitting and immediately I was transferred to a cocktail party where I saw my sister you know flirting with a family friend 
and I wanted to go back home, and I said, I want to go home, and in a second, I was floating again in Lapland above my physical body, and I, I started getting seasick, because, you know, floating, it's like I get seasick on sail. And I thought, gee, I have to watch out that I don't throw up because then that body of mine is going to suffocate. All the thoughts, all the intelligence was in the energy body. There was nothing in my physical. It was just like a corpse. And I just concentrated. I want to get back. Wow. And then I, I went in. And I was there. And I was cold. And I was stiff. And I thought, gee. And I fell asleep. And in the morning, I called Helsinki. And my father was on the, on the phone. And I said, what was my mother doing 8 p.m.? yesterday last night well i can't tell you it's a christmas gift for you she's making i said it's a long dress with the flowers and 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 sewn by hand and my father said how did you know and i told him and of course he said don't ever tell anybody and i went to the finnish press and of course <laughs> my position you know that was the punk either she's crazy or there's something to it and when i wrote the book um, um there's no death some psychiatrist had called the chief medical officer of Finland and, and said, you know, she has to be locked up. This is, this is terrible. I mean, she's a, a doctor in a position and she says there's no death. We all know there's a death. So the surgeon general, chief medical officer said, well, just read the book. She's replaced me, so it's okay. <laughs> and it became, of course, number one bestseller in the country. And it opened up, you know, uh, uh, the whole field in Scandinavia. Because nobody else had ever done anything like that. 82. It was early. And uh, I remember when I was in, in New Mexico at Chris Chriscombs, who was uh, Shirley MacLaine's healer, course in the, in the uh, well, it was the desert. And there we went, went into hypnosis and uh, we were told to, to imagine or see ourselves as whatever. And all of a sudden I saw myself as a huge violet seven-story icebreaker it was breaking ice, three, four meters of ice, so that other boats and, 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 and smaller boats could follow. I thought that was very symbolic, because that's what I've been doing in Scandinavia all, all my life after that. Very so good. Helped. Very, very good. Very good. Now, um, uh, now, now, as you know, there's 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 a resurgence of 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 interest in the afterlife and and um, uh, scientists like Dr. Michael Newton and and others um, uh, scientists on on um, subjects such as uh, uh, s such as um, uh, I, I have them here, uh, such as the, the near death experiences. Uh, these are now being sold by the millions, uh, in, in the U S and in, and in North America. So there's, there's an awakening, uh, to this information. Um, and so what was the content of your book, There Is No Death? What, what content did it have? What, what did it say? Well, uh, basically that man is a mind, not a body. We are all spirits. We are all eternal. Uh, immortality is just a fact for everybody, but uh, it is for our energy, not for our physical, of course. And now, when today I've been hearing, especially in the States, that they are saying that by 45, 2045, there's immortality, and they're trying to say it's for the body, I don't believe that. Because why should anybody want to be in an old, rotten body when you can have a new one? So, we are always reborn. And we are reborn after we have left our body for good, which we, we call, you know, death. We are always allowed to be at our own funeral. And think what it, it, it feels like, you know, everybody's crying and saying she's gone, you know, she's, she's never here again. And you're standing by there and saying, I'm fine. Everything is great. I wouldn't come back if you paid me. And I am absolutely happy. And I've met everybody else from the family and, 
and the relatives who had gone before me, and we have a great time. We're here honoring the life that has been spent now and sort of looking what was learned and what is still left to be learned. So, uh, you know, it is, it's a philosophy. I think it, um, and I had never at that time been uh, acquainted with any Asian philosophies. They believe in reincarnation. I mean, Buddhists and, and, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the, for them it is Hindus, it, for them it is normal. But it's the Western world, the white people who don't understand this in general. And when you think that the white people, our race is only 7% of the world population. So actually, what does it matter what the 7% thinks? Right. But of course, we have the, we have the technology. Yeah. But coming well, up, China and, and, and India. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, of course, uh, of course, as you know, there there's a very uh, prominent. He 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 passed over several years ago, a Canadian researcher, Doctor Ian Stevenson, a professor. I know. The, yeah, I knew him. I, I mean, I met him. We discussed yeah. these. Yeah, yeah, good. He 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 was a professor at the University of Virginia Medical School, and he's left behind a department there, and they specialize in the study of reincarnation from a scientific point of view. So slowly these these areas are are beginning to come in and um, uh, now let let me take this uh, into the next area because we're now coming up to 1985 and and it says that, your interest in UFOs, and I assume ex extraterrestrials, which is the next area of the interdimensional, may have started with a car accident, which led to your retirement from the public service in the medical field and in, in, in the public health field, rather. And I wondered if you could talk about that. How, is that accurate? What, what occurred there? No, it had nothing to do with the car accident. That is uh, this information which oh, is spread by, by Wikipedia. Wikipedia has changed uh, stories about me three times thoroughly, oh, and mostly it is disinformation. But what okay. happened is, uh, is that uh, <clears throat> I did get interested into the UFO field because I started going to conferences all over the world, uh, from Moscow to Washington, D.C., and everything in between. And um, then I asked when I met Andrei Puhari, uh, who was a Yugoslavian-American doctor who brought yes. Yuri Gill to the Western world. And uh, we were lecturing in, uh, at the University of Wisconsin in a parapsychological conference at the same time and had a dinner date together. And Andrei was saying to me that, um, that he is flying with UFOs. And I, I looked at him and said, look, you're a colleague. I mean, come on, tell me. And he said, yes, really. And, and of course, Yuri is doing too, too. And I thought, well, 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 I don't know what to believe. But then I challenged him. I said, okay, why don't you take me along next time you're flying? And, you know, he took it very seriously and said, where do you live? I said, I live by a river in a row house um, and, and in, in Lapland. And my neighbors are used to anything. They wouldn't be so surprised if a UFO landed. They would just say, oh, it's Ronnie again or whatever. <laughs> and so we were just laughing. And I forgot the whole thing. And two months passed, and I had bought a little booklet, haiku poems, Japanese poems, and the name of the booklet was First Contact. And I had a young actress uh, from Rovaniemi Theater visiting me that, that evening, and I said, hey, this is a nice uh, haiku poem, it's First Contact. I read it, for four or five lines, and we glanced, I said, look, out of the window. And we both froze, there was a UFO about a hundred yards from us, about a hundred yards from the, from the, uh, the ground. And he was just still standing, I mean, in the air. And to my great surprise, I have never, ever been afraid of anything. I've been in Malaysia, they were putting, you know, guns uh, at, at me. They were trying to, you know, kill me or whatever. I, I, you know, so what? There was no death. But that moment, I just froze with fear. And I couldn't understand. And I just put my hands and said, please don't come. Please don't come. I realized that this is something that I'm not in control of. And it was there for 15 minutes. And then it flew away. And of course, we, we explained, no, it was the moon. It was, you know, it, 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 we were just shocked, both of us. Then 
next morning, we opened the Lapland Times, the newspaper. A hundred people had called the police and the army and the newspaper. They had seen something, a, a light or a UFO or whatever, something right there next to the river. So the, the Air Force um, colonel, uh, yeah, I think he was a colonel or general, was asked what it was, um, chief of the Lapland Air Force, and he said it was, a, it was a Soviet rocket. And I just laughed. A Soviet rocket comes behind my window, stays 50 minutes and says, hi, Rowney, and then goes away. I mean, come on, that was a cover story. Then went four years, and we had a new chief for the Lapland Air Force. And then, then uh, he was asked, what was this thing happening four years ago? And he said, it was a flock of birds. The usual disinformation that the Air Force and, and the military always gives. They are either Venus or flock of birds or, or satellite or whatever. Then I knew it was a UFO. But what I did not know until three years had passed that uh, I was in Geneva. I was living four years in Geneva. My husband was, my second husband was uh, working uh, with, with the UN as a diplomat. And I went to, to, uh, to a UFO conference. And uh, there we were all put, it was in, in Basel, we were put into mass hypnosis to a very important event in your life. And all of a sudden I went into that night, I mean just spontaneously, and then I recalled that I was taken up into the UFO, which I had physically not remembered at all. And they were doing experiments on me like, you know, I would do with a, with a baby that I'm, I'm inspecting who comes to me uh, as a medical patient or whatever. And that changed my life totally. Because, of course, the beings that were there did not look human to, to me. They were different, a different race. And I had never seen them. I had never even seen pictures of them. But it was a small race with, with beautiful big eyes and, and um, no hair and no teeth. And very friendly, very good, emanating love. And after that, I have had contacts. And once, uh, once they took, a, when I had a contact, they took uh, something over my body. And I said, what are you doing? We are making a copy of your body for cloning. And I thought that was so traumatic that I came out of the hypnosis. And believe it or not, some people who knew me in Rovaniemi had been to Spain, Canary Islands, and uh, had seen me in a discotheque and could describe the clothes that I was wearing, but I was not there. I was not oh. there. So it probably was the clone. Oh. Anyway, I had, those, I had those clothes. And they just said that I had just disappeared. But I don't take it badly because I think actually we are all clones cloning ourselves from our energy body and when i have had these contacts i previously were, were uh, much more often now i have been suppressed because electromagnetic fields because the i think norwegian military and intelligent agencies are trying to shut me up anyway but when i did have those contacts so i asked them do you have a god and the answer was yes of course i said well what kind of god i mean what what is your god and the answer, answer flabbergasted me, God is love, period. Think of it. Nobody kills, nobody fights for your God. God is love. And that, I think, is a big, big lesson to the to people on planet Earth. Wow, that is amazing. So these are, um, do, do these contacts continue now for you? Not consciously. Not consciously, and I haven't, like I said, I have been beamed, and I'm beamed almost every night by electromagnetic fields, and I had a microwave leak detector so I can prove it. Uh, that suppresses my, my ability to get out of body. And anyway, in the morning, I don't remember. And uh, also previously, I had to be put into hypnosis normally to, to remember these contacts. But I believe that I am being watched over because <clears throat> for one reason or another, because uh, I wrote automatic writing when I was in Rovaniemi. It was the third, uh, the ninth of, of March, uh, eighty-five. And automatic writing said, "You're not allowed to drive the car today." And I said, "Well, why not?" In my thoughts. 
you're trying to change your destiny and right now it's not possible. It was supposedly my dead grandmother who was coming through and giving me warnings. And um, I said, uh, look, Grandma, you're dead. You're not giving me any orders. And I just threw the pencil down, hopped into the car and put two pairs of skis and started going north to go skiing. And what happened, I realized all of a sudden after 14 kilometers, I was on the wrong road. And I had been in that, in that um, city already for 12 years. So I thought somebody's trying to, you know, trying to influence me. So I put the brakes on, and it was new snow. I started, to, you know, going badly with my car, and I looked through the uh, through the mirror, and I saw there was a bus coming behind me. And the last thought I had, I hope it doesn't drive over me, and that's exactly what it did. The bus drove over me. It was a teacher taking forty kids, to, school kids, to, to to go skiing, and he had a chance either to drive over me or 40 kids to the woods. And of course, he did the right d decision. He drove over my car and the bus stopped at my at my uh, seat, my front seat. I'm, I mean, it, it went into a accordion and it went spinning and around, of course, and I hit my head to the window shield so badly that the window shield broke. I mean, that is a hit. And then later found out that the uh, rib I had a belt, the rib had got to my heart. And of course, I was bleeding inside. But at that time, all of a sudden, a little entity comes and it looked like one of those little aliens comes and gives prana healing to me. And I was just looking at it and, and I, I didn't understand anything. It had no hair, no teeth. It was brownish in color and it was giving prana healing very, very fast giving me energy and later I understood it stopped my bleeding I would have bled to death inside and then when the ambulance came after 20 minutes and and there was also in the bus there was on the first seat there was a policeman and his wife who was a nurse so I got immediate help and then when the ambulance came I said take the other one too the other one I had two pairs of skis I meant the little little entity that was helping me. I said, they take that one too to the ambulance. And then I heard some ambulance men say, oh, she's hallucinating. She's hit her head. And I looked at this entity and I realized, uh-uh, this is one of those things that I see. And you're in another dimension, actually, and they don't see. And I became unconscious again. They took me to the hospital. And when a doctor is a patient, some doctors are very nervous and they made all the mistakes they can do. They didn't even take a skull x-ray and threw me out. This happened on Saturday, and I had to go home. They threw me out on, on Monday, and I couldn't even walk. But that was a revenge from the surgeon, because I knew something bad about him. I had never opened my mouth about it, but that's, that's what he did. But it was meant to be. And after one month, I wrote automatic writing again, and the first thing came from my dead grandmother. You still have not learned the lesson of obedience. You would have died if we had not interfered and given you another chance to do your life's work. And now, if I get a warning, I will definitely, definitely listen. But it took me, my body to be crushed, and I was almost two years on sick leave, and then retired. But that was meant to be. That was meant to be. I was warned. I was warned about it already in, in the beginning of 80s. Yeah. By a, a clairvoyant. He said, I want you for a big car accident that changes your life. And he gave me a reading and said, you're going to moved to Central Europe, I said, never, I'll never leave Lapland. And, and uh, everything that he has said has happened. After the accident, I moved to Geneva. Now, he also said, you're going to be an international bestseller author. That is what I am now. And then he said, you're going to die in a warm country with white flat roofs out of heart or, or brain, uh, you know, something happening. And when my husband said, shall we buy a house in Spain? I said, not yet. <laughs> Now, now, who is he again? Who, who, who was telling you this? This was Robin Stevens, a, a clairvoyant in England. He's oh. fast. He's dead, and uh, he was uh, uh, an administrator at the at the biggest uh, hospital in London. I, I see. And spiritualist, and he came to visit Rovaniemi, and some spiritualist friends said, "Rowney, he wants to meet you. He's heard about it." about you and we had an evening together. I invited him for five o'clock tea, but of course we finished it up with, with a bottle of whiskey. And it was fun. But this is what he told me and everything yeah. has what he told me. Yeah. 
I believe that your life is predicted, but you can't change it. I didn't have to go, to go you know, on that on that uh, car drive. I could have listened. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it's predicted. Right, right. Now, um, part of what, what I've been working on is what I call the dimensional ecology. That is the ecology, how intelligence in the multiverse works in an ecology of dimensions. And if I understand the, the, the incident with the bus and, and the gray and, and, your, and your grandmother is an example of, of the interaction between the afterlife, the, the, the dimension uh, in which the, the, the grave finds itself and the time space in which you in you in in which you find yourself ha, have you looked at that that is what the interaction between the afterlife and the grays in the in in the in in the extraterrestrial in their extraterrestrial di dimensions are well i haven't looked but i have understood at least for myself that yeah. uh, they're on yeah. another frequency yeah it's just like another tv show or a radio show you just click and you get another other program and yeah. they are on other frequency but they can come to ours yeah and sometimes we can go to theirs and that's very simple but of course people who don't know that uh, there's no death that we are energy beings they they have, have a hard time understanding this and especially when you think that there are timelines you can go back and forth and wherever yeah. you can go to the future or the you know that goes so complicated that I usually leave it out because it's enough that you get through the message that we are immortal beings and there is no death and love is the answer I mean that's my message always I try to get that out right right now being now now we come here now when and how did did this morph into the 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 mind control agenda and and where you become aware of the microchips the the beaming uh the electromagnetics the the scalar the harassment all of that when when does that begin to happen well that was uh, quite a few years ago been when I was in, in, in conferences in, in the U.S. And, and people started talking about microchips. And of course, I had never heard of them or I had never seen them. But somehow I started researching it. And then I realized this is a very, very bad programming, which is in the medical field. And in 1997, the British Medical Journal in July 12th wrote an article where it was warning doctors not to go into weapon industry and microchipping a human being is going into the weapon industry. So uh, I started reading about it and now I know that uh, the microchips are about two micromillimeter when your hair diameter is 50 mi uh, micromillimeter so they cannot be taken away anymore. Uh, they are injected through, uh, through uh, vaccinations like the swine flu uh, Injections, that's when everybody got a microchip. And of course, it was not told to the people and not even to the doctors who work in the field or the nurses. Only doctors who are in the scientific field or on the, on the highest levels, they know about it. In Finland, even a professor at our highest medical institute stated that um, the swine flu uh, influenza vaccine is, is harmless. Well, <laughs> there are deaths. There are abortions, there are narcolepsy. I mean, now, especially in the States, there are many, many court cases. We know it is very, very bad. And the, they continue this depopulation programs with the vaccines. With Gardasil, now they say that even boys should have it, even if it is officially against uh, cancer of the uterus, of the tip of the uterus, and boys don't have a uterus. But then they said, oh, well, it is a viral infection. So it is just... To get, and that I think is so unethical, so immoral that I can't understand doctors who are going into it if they are aware, and those in the field are normally not aware. But money is 
the answer always in these things. And, and uh, when you think of, of today's medicine, in Finland, for instance, they just had a gallop of different things of doctors. And can you imagine, 75% of Finnish doctors, mostly young male doctors, said that healing is fraud and should be prohibited. Now, this is atrocious. It just shows that they have no idea what it is to be a human being. They don't know that a man is a, an energy. They just think it's, it's, it's fraud. And of course, then there is some, some people who are doing very bad things, who are not real healers, uh, who cause very bad, bad um, reputation to the real healers. But you have to differentiate with the healer and, and somebody who has... No, no education who is just doing things for money. But uh, things are changing. Things are changing. Because already now the Finnish Medical Association's magazine just wrote in the number 34. And you met three professors all in a UN committee claiming that uh, Fukushima was less than Chernobyl, and there are no health effects of Fukushima, and no health effects are expected to be from Fukushima, and everybody who follows any news knows that the situation is extremely critical even today. Exactly. So why are doctors giving this information? I think they're bought. I think it's money. Because I know one one man who was a British man who is now in America, he told me himself, he was a UFO expert, uh, dealing with crop circles. He told me himself, I was offered from the U.S. one million dollars if I, in one TV program, give this information. I was so shocked that I didn't even, you know, ask, did you take it? Amazing. So, you know, it's money. It's big money. Yeah. Now, now let me ask you, uh, to, uh, to, to get between the, the nexus of mind control, the national security state, and the extraterrestrials, because there are, uh, there, for example, um, Mary Rodwell, uh, uh, an expert in 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 um, the extraterrestrial field, uh, speaks of 150 species of greys. There, there are 150 known species of greys, and there are there are some greys who have been engaged in a not so beneficial agenda, supposedly. And even yesterday, uh, here in Vancouver, I deal with certain individuals that are called targeted individuals. These are individuals who have been chipped and are, and are being tortured by microwave and by other means. And this one individual also uh, is abducted and has had Grays come into his bedroom since childhood, but he claims that he's tortured both by the Grays and by the microwave torturing, and I and 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 and, and he's been trying to and we go back and forth, and I say, well, maybe that's the microwave torturing attempting to mimic the extraterrestrials to put exactly. to, exactly. to yeah and, and he says no no I still keep on thinking it's the it's 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 the extraterrestrials do you have any opinion on this I, I agree with your idea I think it is not extraterrestrials I think it's the military and secret services who are pretending to be ETs and they can make you see things they can make you feel things they can make you hear things just about anything it is just a certain beam, a certain picture into your brain, and you see and experience that it is an extraterrestrial torturing you, and it is only U.S. military, for instance. Uh, when you think that we as humans look down upon ants, let's put it this way, I mean, it's, it's a nice society, and they have a queen, and they have, a, you know, a babysitters, they have workers, everything. Would we go and torture them? Why would we do it? There's no reason for it. They're no threat to us, but we are interested in their society because it is an intelligence race. 
but we think at least that we are more intelligent, more advanced than the, the ants are. I'm not sure we are, but, but that's our way of thinking. And this is exactly what I think the ETs are doing, because the universal law, as far as I have understood it, absolutely forbids interference with low-class societies. And unfortunately, planet Earth is a very low-class society, because we are beings who use less than 10% of our brain capacity. We are always at war. We hate each other. We're envious. We, we're very negative. We're aggressive. Why are we like this? And we are an ape race. I mean, we, from, from gibbon apes and from chimpanzees, the humans are differing only with one to two percent. But it would be an insult if I would say you're a, you're, you're a monkey or an ape. But that's what we are. We are an ape race. And since we are so primitive that we have not even today stopped killing our own race with wars, we are not, I would say, of interest to the ETs. Uh, this, uh, I recently just read a very interesting Russian report. Uh, General Lieutenant General um, uh, Savin, uh, very, very high up in, in the military, uh, gave an interview. And when they asked, why are you telling these things now? So he answered that, well, it's time that people get to know. And what he was saying that Russia is trying to make uh, superhumans, that's super soldiers, which the U.S. also does, and they have certain um, techniques to do that. And he said they are trying to have contacts with ETs, like Americans are doing. And he said they were dividing people into three groups. One was military, uh, one was scientists, and one was a group of women. And with a certain technique, which he did not reveal, but they had um, eliminated hallucinations and, and, and uh, mental illness, etc. The group that did the best to get ET contact, surprise, surprise, was the group of women. And actually, it's not a surprise when you think, because women are more open and they dare to, you know, show their feelings, etc. Anyway, the women that went into the spaceship had a discussion with the ETs, and the ETs were saying that we are actually not interested in the human race because you are on such a low level, but we have to, in a way, uh, survey you because it is like children that you don't destroy yourselves. So we sort of look at you as children who have to be, you know, guarded, guarded, that they don't do bad things, but we are not interested in you because there is not much exchange. Of course, we don't have much exchange with ant ants either. And I think that's, this is very, very significant when a high general in, in, in Russia says this. And on the other hand, when <clears throat> when... The White House has stated now to official inquiries that we have White House has no no uh, proof of any extraterrestrial life in the universe nor on planet Earth. And at the same time, I have heard these uh, stories of of, uh, of how Obama has been twice on Mars. So that is you know uh, that is such a contradiction. And when one has said that information comes from Russia. So uh, today's Prime Minister, Medvedev, who was also also before president, stated in, a, in an interview, which I have seen myself and heard myself, he said that when you become president of Russia, you get two attaché cases. One is the code for atom war, and the other one is the information about extraterrestrial life on planet Earth and in the universe. So Russian supreme commander gives correct information and U.S. denies everything. That's crazy. Right, so right. What do you want to believe? Yeah, well, I, I was actually the, the reporter that, that published the story from whistleblowers Andrew D. Pachago and William Brett Stillings that Obama had been on Mars and... It, and it was the, the Obama National Security Council Public Relations di Director, Tommy Veter, that at the beginning of 2012 
issued an official denial of that story that Obama <laughs> had been on Mars. So you're you are you are totally right. Now, uh, let me ask you this: you you have now become very active um, in a Brussels-based group, uh, which is uh, seeking to uh, uh, educate the world and to ban. Uh, all of these new weapons, the the uh, scalar weapons for for mind control uh, and for uh, the the robotization of humans, some people call it the transhumanist agenda. Could you talk more about that and what the perils of the transhumanist agenda are and what we can do about it? Well, um, I'm afraid that I don't think that um, legal systems can do much, but we will try, of course, because if you do have law on your side, that helps. But it has gone too, too far. Because uh, today, when we have chemtrails, that's legal in the United States. Now, how can you do something away with if it's legal? And since the European Union has, the European Parliament has forbidden already 2009 uh, these these uh, technologies affecting uh, uh, human behavior, nothing has happened in Europe. But five states, at least in the United States, the first one in Michigan, uh, first of, of uh, 2004, has forbidden these. But has it been implemented? That I don't know. But uh, I don't think it's just legislation. It is awareness, awareness, awareness that people get to know these things. And when you microchip people with vaccinations without their consent, that, of course, is criminal. But what can you do except, like the Finnish Medical Association years and years and years ago, forbid microchipping because uh, two people whom I closely know were microchipped by an unethical doctor who was a Finnish doctor who was um, uh, trained in Pennsylvania to do this. So what happens? Nothing. They just may, may get that, hey, you're not allowed to do this. Please stop. And they don't stop because they get paid so well. So there's a very big problem of ignorance in the general public and then the attitudes of the elite who wants to continue. And when you think that 85% of world population has to be eliminated, according to Rio conference uh, 1992, so, of course, they are doing this. So, why would they not eliminate? Because it is elimination when you are microchipped and when you're beamed with microwaves and when you're beamed with laser, when they induce cancer or any other disease. They can induce in a few seconds a myocardial infarction. They can induce a, a brain damage in a second. I mean, this is what they're doing. They don't kill, kill with guns anymore so much they induce illnesses. And of course, that's unethical. It's immoral. And the only thing I think that can do something is raising awareness of the general population, talking about it. This is not what we want. And that may help. And of course, we are trying to do that, that again, the European Parliament would remember that their own decisions have not been implemented. They're nice decisions, nice, nicely written. ECT implants are not to be uh, mis misused by uh, Professor Jöran um, uh, Hermeren from Sweden, who was the, the, the leader of the ethics conference 2005. But what has happened? They just continue. They don't care. So what is the solution? That is a good question. Awareness, absolutely. Right. And, and so what, what, do you, what do you recommend for our viewers, what, what, what do you, th what, what should they do as we're looking at our future now? And we have all of these different strains. We, we have awareness about the afterlife and eternity. We have awareness about the interdimensionality and extraterrestrials, but we have awareness about the very real threat of the transhumanist agenda, which is attempting to robotize humanity how how do you think that that i think we i think we forward? have 
make people to understand. That means if it's videos, if it's, it's uh, uh, magazine articles, it's lectures, whatever, because everybody will say, no, I don't want my children to be biological robots to computers, to satellites. And this is what they want. I mean, it's official that 85% of population has to be eliminated and the rest are going to be biological robots to the elite. And nobody wants this except the elite, if they know, but they don't know. They are suppressed with information because corporate-owned mass media, which is at least 85%, if not over 90, they never talk about this because they're not allowed. To. They give only this information. So the word of mouth, lectures, alternate media, that may change the thing because if we all, the people of planet Earth who understand this, take our energy and focus on the goodness in all of us, on the goodness of the universe, ask for help from the goodness of the universe and send those vibes out, I don't think their, their weapons would work. But you can't do that if you're not uh, aware of the situation. So awareness, awareness, awareness. Well, we, we certainly want to thank you for, for being w w with us and, and, and for sharing with us the extraordinary multidimensionality of your life and such an example, and also bringing the strength of character and of awareness that you have brought. And we hope that you will join us from time to time as, as uh, events develop. Thank you. And remember, there is no death and we are not alone in the universe. God is love. Thank you very much.